Uh, good morning, friends. Welcome to all of you on this uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving, and trust that you had uh, hopefully not too much chaos with family and friends and lots of food. And how many of you got the carbohydrate crash right now, huh? Well, uh, I hope that you get amped up before the day is done. Man, that I was just encouraged by our children and seeing all those wonderful decisions for Christ. Isn't that awesome? We just praise the Lord for Jeff and Josh and all the wonderful team and all that they're doing. Hey, uh, before we get into God's Word, just want to mention that next Sunday, really excited about that. My friend Randy Phillips is going to be with me. It's going to be an awesome day. You want to make sure and come and get in the front seats and get ready to hear uh, and a fantastic uh, word and just a dynamic speaker. And who knows, uh, my friend Dan Dean might come with him. We might uh, spring a little bit of Phillips, Craig, and Dean on you Sunday morning. So uh, don't miss it. Invite your friends, be with us. And then, of course, a few seats still left uh, for Sunday night, I think. Uh, not a lot, but uh, if, you're, if you're still interested in coming, I'd love for you to just come and celebrate with us as we do a little bit of Christmas a little bit of uh, Phillips, Craig, and Dean oldies, and uh, a little bit of Phillips, Craig, and Dean new stuff. So, hey, let's go to God's Word today. Uh, if you have a Bible or an app or something, you can pull up 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're in this series ending today called Kings and Queens, and I think this is just a great way for us to enter uh, December and Advent, Christmas season uh, beginning to look toward the perfect king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So the Old Testament gives us a, a picture, although a dim one, of what the king should look like. And so David, we've looked at him as, as one who has made some good decisions, as one who has uh, brought peace to Jerusalem, but then a turn of events as uh, Josiah so aptly helped us with last week to see that this man wasn't perfect. And we begin to see that there is a longing for a true and generous king and pointing toward the king who is to come. Well, what we're going to look at today is David's response to his sin and learning how that we can, as people of God, as uh, children of God, we know that we sin, we know that we fall short, but how do we live in this world and become like Jesus? Because our our mission here is to follow Jesus for God's glory. Say it with me, follow Jesus for God's glory. So that's, that's the purpose, so we wanna become like Jesus. So how do we do that when we realize we're, we're inadequate, we make mistakes and we flub and we, we do things that are, are not becoming of children of God? So if you're new today and you think, uh, that, you think that all the Christians think that we've got our act together, no, we're honest, we don't. But we've got this loving Savior who is forgiving us and changing us. Speaking of change, I'm gonna talk about change of heart. I have a friend who used to speed a lot. I pray that he doesn't anymore. But on the highway, he would frequently go faster than he should. And he would tell me about how often he could get out of tickets, which is probably, uh, as a Christian, it's probably not something you're supposed to brag about. But he would tell me about how that he would, you know, explain things and uh, gradually, you know, somehow convince the highway patrol that really, you know, let him off the hook this time. I actually was in the car once with him when that happened. I was impressed about how, you know, he just explained things and said, man, I was on this, I was going here and I, I should have left earlier offices here, but I'm really sorry. I promise not to do it again. And he didn't get a ticket. And then I thought, well, I'm going to try that next time. It didn't work for me. It's never worked for me. And I think maybe it's just the mercy of God, God saying, you know what, buddy? Why don't you just slow down? Maybe that's my plan for you. Instead of getting you out of a ticket, maybe I'm going to let you get a ticket because that's a good way to help you remember, slow down. So it changes you when you start looking at it like that. I've seen a man elsewhere that I won't name any names, a man who I, I have known on occasion to take his wife's car and drive it until it's just got 10 miles left to empty. Now, I won't mention his name, but he is, 
He is one who has been known to do that sort of thing, and then he'll come over and, and reason in his mind and say something like, well, you know, I was just, I was just in a real big hurry. And next time, I promise, I won't do that again. And I convince myself, and then I think about my wife filling up the tank, and I think, that's just, a, that's being a dog, man. Don't do that anymore. And then I find myself in a hurry someday, or I don't, don't have my wallet handy, or it's cold outside, or, you know, any number of excuses, and I, and I do it again. Now, what we discover over time is that change is hard and that the sin that we act out is actually something that's really deep in us. It's not something that just happens. It's not something that, that we just sort of fall into, but actually there's a pathway into it. But sometimes we, we dance around change and we dance around what God really wants for us rather than just getting to the real problem. And it's that pesky word that we don't like, that biblical word that we don't like to say, that word that we associate with those really bad people in the world, sin. Let's try to say it, ready? One, two, three, sin. Yeah, it kind of sticks in our throat. And when we think of the idea of sinner, we think of all those really, really bad people out there but what I do is not sin. What I do is I make mistakes. I just kind of fall off the wagon now and then, but it, it's really not sin. But we sin, and we want forgiveness, and we want change, and speed without tickets is what we may want. Uh, what we may want is carbs without gaining weight, what we may want is to be able to say whatever we feel and there be no consequences, but that's not real life. Uh, so David, this good king, man after God's own heart, does something horrible. And for the sake of the children in the room, I'll paraphrase and just encourage you as adults to go back and read chapter 11 to see what he did if you missed last week. But in summation, what he does is he steals another man's family. He uses his power to overpower a beautiful lady, and he becomes an accomplice to murder, and then he covers it up, and then he moves on like nothing happened. And we think, how could a good king, a man who is after God's own heart, how could he do something like this? And he thinks he can just move on, but the Bible's very clear in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27. It says that when the mourning was over, when the weeping was over, when the funeral was over, David sent and brought her, Bathsheba, to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But this last phrase gives us the true picture of how God looks at it. Read it with me. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, sometimes we think we can just move on and think, well, we've kind of covered it up, and I said I'm sorry, and, and what else do I need to do? And when, when heaven is looking on and God says, you might be a man after my own heart, but that ain't right, and it displeased the Lord. So a prophet, a preacher sent from God, comes to David. His name was Nathan, and for this part, I need a couple of volunteers. I think I saw uh, a Caleb Caleb out here, is Caleb Hartman here? Can you come and help me? And uh, Jesse, would you come and help me? All right, and then uh, Anthony, would you come? And I, I don't want you to help us with the prop over here. I want you to stand, I want you to stand over here, Caleb and Jesse. I want you to stand right here, and this is gonna represent the two guys. So what Nathan says to David, he says, I wanna tell you a story. He says, uh, there were Two men, somebody say two men. Two young men right here. And one of them was very rich and had lots of lambs and sheep, so pour them out in front of Jesse, all the lambs. He had lots of sheep and lambs. Thanks, buddy. And he was rich. And he had his sheep and he had lots of parties. He had 
all kinds of gifts for people. And then there was a poor man who had one lamb. And he loved the lamb. And he fed the lamb. And he hugged the lamb. And he kissed the lamb. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he fed the lamb out of his own cup. He let the lamb drink from his own cup. This is in the Bible, guys. It says this. And this man had this one lamb. He really loved it, and the kids loved it. There came a point that the rich man was having a big Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, we're just paraphrasing now. Having a big Thanksgiving dinner while he's got all, the, all of his riches and all of his sheep. But he says, I don't want to cook one of my lambs because I want to keep all my own. And so what did he do? He went to the guy who had one lamb and he took it from him. Jesse, <laughs> help me out here. And the poor man cried. <laughs> he cried and he said, I don't have my lamb anymore. And King David, when he heard this story, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he was enraged. He, and the prophet said, the prophet just kind of dropped the mic right then. He says, well, uh, David says, well, I tell you what ought to happen. The guy who did that, he ought to, be, he ought to have to pay it back four times. Because that's not fair that he had no mercy, no pity on the man who only had one lamb. And Nathan looked straight at King David, pointed his finger, and he said what? You are the man. Thank you, guys. Great job. <laughs> Just leave him there, Anthony. It's, it's no problem. You are that man. And David's response shows us why he is still God's man. Because here's what we do sometimes when we're confronted with our sin, our mistakes, our failures, what do we do? Well, the first thing we might do is just go, oops, I, I made a mistake, man. We're humans, humans make mistakes. No mistake is like I put sugar in the, in the tea instead. I put sugar, I, I should have put sugar in the tea. I put salt. That's a mistake. Or what else do we do? We explain. Oh, this is a popular one today. But you don't understand. You don't understand. My situation is unique. I'm different my situation is different, so that's, that's why it happened. Or we blame shift. Let's say, well, this would happen to you if you had the same kind of dynamics that happened to me in my life, if you had my upbringing, if you had my home life, if you had my difficulties in life. He made me do it. She made me do it. Oh, this was good when in the Craig household when I was little. Mom, he made me do it. That never worked. And it doesn't work with God. What we tend to think of is that, that our actions are somewhere out there that have little to do with us. And the Bible tells us something completely different. It says that sin begins on the inside. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When we say something, it began here. When we do something, it begins here. It's like, like the, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, this cup of cranberry juice. I, I want to hold it carefully because why? It stains. If I had a white shirt on, it's like, don't spill it, don't spill it, whatever you do. Or you have a white tablecloth, it's like you hold it carefully, and if someone were to bump into you uh, or, and, and they shook you, what, what will happen? Well, it might spill. Or if I trip, or if I stumble. But why does the cranberry juice come out of the cup? 
little trick question here. Uh, we might say, well, see, he hit me. He bumped me. Uh, the reason that cranberry juice comes out of the cup because cranberry juice is in the cup. We have to change what's on the inside to change what comes out of us when we are shaken, when we are bumped. And what God wants to do is he wants to change what's on the inside so that no matter what happens, now life happens, but what comes out is what's on the inside. And God wants to give us the water of life. He wants to change our hearts. Uh, we might ask David, David, why did you do what you did? He could have said, well, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I, I was tempted because of pressure, peer pressure. I was shaken up. Because I was stressed out. That's a new one. My emotions were disturbed. I was weary, and I was, just, I was just minding my own business, and I looked out there, and there was that beautiful woman. I couldn't help myself. I mean, I'm a guy. And that's what instinctively we say, rather than to say what David teaches us to say. And what David, this is why David is a man after God's own heart, is because after Nathan says, you are the man, and, he's, and he goes on and says, here's what the Lord says. The Lord says, I gave you everything you have. I gave you the throne. I gave you wives. I gave you a palace. I gave you this and this and this. You were a wealthy man, and what did you do? You had no mercy and no pity. And when he gets to the end of his little sermon, David says this, I have sinned against the Lord. Very important. If we're gonna grow, if we're gonna change, it begins with a full confession. There's a difference between an apology and a confession. You guys have had friends that say, I'm sorry if I hurt you. That's not a confession. Confession is to say, I was wrong. I should have filled up the gas tank. Officer, I was speeding. Uh, that was wrong. Not to say, well, I'm, ap I'm apologizing if I got you upset. That's not, a, that's not a confession. What David recognizes and what's important for us today, I want to talk about uh, how he begins to find change of heart. And we're going to turn over to Psalm 51, this psalm that it, it, David wrote later so helpful for us, and if you look in your Bibles or you look on your app, you'll find that at the beginning of this chapter, it's Psalm 51, it says to the choir master or the song director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So here's what David writes. Here's his attitude after he is confronted, and he begins in verse one saying, have mercy on me Oh, God. My friends, let me remind you and us today, here is one prayer that God will always, always answer. You don't have to guess. I wonder if God will hear me. I wonder if God will answer my prayer. If you say, have mercy on me, oh God, God will answer that prayer. Isn't that good? Now David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now let me just mention here six steps real quickly from this chapter on how we can begin to change when we sin, because we do. And number one is that we turn quickly to God and we turn away from our sin. Sometimes what we do, we turn quickly to God and we go, I'm sorry, God, but we never turn away from the sin. Hello. Turn away from it. Say, God, my greed, God, my selfishness, God, the way my mouth gets in the way. Not just I'm sorry and I go back to the sin to repeat the same thing, but I turn away from it. I realize that that's a lie. And I realize that my life, my hope, my, my joy, my savior, I've got to turn to him. This is what David said, have mercy on me, O God. Not only that, he owned it. 
He owned it. There was no, there was no blame game, no, no blame shifting, no saying, I couldn't help it. He owned it. We just read where he said, I have sinned against the Lord. We see it here in verses two and three again. He says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. It's my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. Number three, we recognize that every sin, no matter how small, when we sin against people, it's still a sin against God. This puts gravity on on our actions, doesn't it? We recognize that every sin is a sin against God. Psalm 51, verses four through six. Against you, God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So he recognizes this is a sin against God. This helps me, my friends, maybe brothers in the house, maybe some husbands, you get this and this will help you, that sometimes when I'm getting Every once in a while, I'll get just a little irritated at my wife, as lovely and as beautiful as she is. And some of you are going to say, how could you ever? I don't know. I'm a sinner. But sometimes when that happens is what I will do. I will picture the Lord Jesus Christ standing behind her, saying, this is my daughter. Be careful. And that changes my attitude. And I recognize that when I sin against her, I'm actually sinning against God because that is his daughter. Number four, it starts with the heart. Psalm 51 and six, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the, what? Secret heart, verse 10. Read this with me, verse 10. Create create in me a clean heart, oh God. You know that God is still in the business of creating. It didn't stop in Genesis 1 and 2, hallelujah. God is still doing new things. We witnessed that this morning in seeing these children come to faith. We believe that those who are in Christ are what? New creations, the old has passed away. Behold, all things are made new. So God is still creating new things. And so when we look to him and we say, God, make me new on the inside, he will. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Number five, we partner with the Holy Spirit, verses 11 and 12, Psalm 51. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Now in the Old Testament, the spirit would come and go. He would rest upon you and then he would leave. In the New Testament, we know that the comforter is always with us. So he doesn't leave us, but we can break fellowship with him. Just like we can, we can offend people, we can offend the Holy Spirit. And so it, it, it concerns God and it grieves the Holy Spirit when we sin against people, when we sin against God. So we partner with him, we say, help me, Holy Spirit. Can I just tell you, I do this every day, just throughout the day, I start to say the wrong thing, help me, Holy Spirit. I'm partnering with you. God, my love has run out right now, I don't have any patience left. Give me some of yours. God, you've gotta take this. That's the way we do it. We partner with the Holy Spirit, and lastly, number six, we help others. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Celebrate recovery, AA is also, this is one of their big steps, step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. What are they saying? They're saying, now that I'm growing, the step to my healing, the step to my change is to help somebody else. How many of you have helped, you've been helped by helping others, yeah? There's something about when you teach someone else what you've learned, it gets in you. David understands this. So David was a wonderful king, my friends, but he was imperfect. He needed a savior. And what he points to is the future remedy. David had it all. He had wealth, he had titles, He had love, he had a beautiful place to live, 
had the presence of God, but he was selfish. So what God did, he said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give my one and only lamb. I who have everything will give my only son. This is the message of Christmas, isn't it? God so loved the world that he gave what? Not his son, don't skip over, his only, his only one. He says, I'm gonna be the good king. I'm gonna be the perfect king. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give my lamb, instead of you feasting on it just for your selfish reasons, here's what's gonna happen. We celebrate this in communion. When we receive the Lamb of God, when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming and he was baptizing people and he was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That word that means to turn away and turn to God. And as he, as he was seeing the Lord Jesus come, he said, behold what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Christmas is about God sending his one and only son, his only lamb, to take away the sins of the world. Are you doing that? Are you turning to God? Are you turning to the Lamb of God? Are you turning away from your sin and turning to God? I'm talking to some children here today. I'm talking to some students who need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking to some adults here today. Are you playing around with the idea of an affair? It's being mulled over in your mind. You're playing around with really telling someone off and holding a grudge you know that unforgiveness is sin? You're sinning against God. Some of you are being just, you've abandoned your post as leader in your home as a dad. You're emotionally distant. You're pouring yourself into your work. You're sinning against your family. My friends, God will not cover what you will not uncover. God will not cover what you will not uncover. It must be confessed. I'm not talking about up before here or all the church. Sometimes you sin against people and you need to confess your sins to that loved one. And, and here's, here's the sad part, my friends, is even if there is forgiveness, sin always has consequences. And you can't always undo the damage that's done by sin. David, he was forgiven. Nathan said, God has taken away your sins. He answered that prayer, have mercy on me, O God. God answered that. There was a lot of bad stuff that happened as a result of his sin. So the idea that we can just apologize and just say, oh, hey, I'm sorry, God, hey, I'm just human and not realize that there are consequences to our sin, we're being not truly biblical. God cannot cover what you will not uncover. So I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask the musicians to come because I just want God to change us as we approach Christmas, as we approach Advent. We say, Lord, start here. Make my heart right, make my heart clean some dudes in the building, some guys, some students, some children. I gave my life to Christ, repented of my sin at, at nine years old. He said, well, what had you done that was so bad and so evil? I was a selfish sinner. Even at eight and nine years old, we've already learned how to say, mine, no. We've already got that attitude. I'm king of the world. We must turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Forgive me of my sins and pray that he would cleanse us. I want everyone 
to bow in the room. For, if please, no one moving around for just a few moments. This is serious business with God, and God wants to hear from you. He saw you walk in this morning. He saw you this week. He saw you last night. and He loves you. He wants to forgive you, but you've got to uncover the sins in your life. We don't reach perfection, but we can say, God, change me from the inside out. Father, I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would talk to us. Lord, that we hear your voice that says, you are the man, you are the woman, you are the one. But you tell us, just turn to me. I will forgive your sin. I will heal you. I will change you from the inside out. Keep turning to me. Lord, so we do that right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, that you have given us the perfect Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.